Good afternoon and a big welcome to all attendees to this webinar on the subject of IPP Generation Asset Performance Monitoring, Reporting and PPA Compliance. My name is Chris Yelland and I'm the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence. I will be your host and moderator at this webinar, signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also to all our presenters, all of whom will be introduced to you in due course. And of course, a big welcome to you, the attendees, for your interest and participation. We have about 1,050 delegates registered to attend this webinar today to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. This attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered and the stature of the presenters. May I express a big thanks to Orion Asset Management for inviting EE Business Intelligence to facilitate this webinar. And of course, to all the presenters for their participation and for the time and effort they have put in. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be made available shortly to all those who registered to attend as well as publicly. While the presentation is in progress, please do send your questions on the Q&A text facility and not on the chat facility. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally. We have set aside about 15 minutes after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. Colleagues, a need has emerged for proactive ongoing oversight of IPP generation assets through various lenses to consider technical performance, financial uh, uh, forecasts, both IRR and debt considerations, and ED compliance. With tariffs being squeezed, and as a result of increased focus on operation and maintenance, CapEx completion and administration costs, real-time performance data is required to provide all stakeholders with information to access the performance and compliance based on the power purchase agreement considerations. Orion Asset Management has been established to provide a credible outsourced option for IPPs and generators and is supported by three recognized industry players who are leaders in their respective sectors. And these are the Cresco Group, who handle financial, commercial, and associated projections, Harmattan Renewables, uh, which is a consulting business, and ED Platform, a business that is involved with economic development, environmental compliance, and broad-based black economic uh, empowerment aspects. This webinar will explain the requirements of IPPs and other generators and detail the opportunity that has been seized by Orion and its three partner companies to serve power generation and off-taker clients with ongoing financial, commercial, technical, ED and compliance needs. So may I now introduce you to Taf Mukwena. Taf is the CEO of Orion Asset Management and he will give us our opening address before we proceed to our further presenters. Over to you, Taf. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you for making the time to join us today. Uh, hopefully we will um, give you a little bit of an insight into what we're, what we're looking at building um, and how we can, we can be of assistance in the market. Um, so as Chris said, my name is Tafadzo Mkwena. I am the CEO of Orion Asset Management. Um, and Orion Asset Management is a business that's just been formed uh, through uh, three partners who will introduce to you as we proceed. Um, but in terms of a little bit about myself, um, I'm an engineer by background, um, but with a strong interest in finance around infrastructure, uh, which has led to you know, ga gaining patients in both fields. Um, and over a 15 year career, I've uh, been involved in managing multidisciplinary teams, which provide professional services um, to the infrastructure sector. Um, and that's the basis around which we're also building Orion to, to provide similar services to, to the spaces in which we'll be operating. Uh, but underlying that, I think one of the things that um, I always think about when it comes to infrastructure 
um, and its ability to deliver services, which is really the point at the end of the day, um, is around our ability to continuously apply the advances in technologies. Um, and for me, I think when we speak technologies, um, often it's easy to, to refer to the engineering technologies, but also uh, I think a consideration must be paid to advances in the technologies in terms of the financial structure around projects and the institutional arrangements that make the market palatable for, for participants to participate in. And yeah, our business is really then looking to, to add to that layer and, and help produce the results that everyone is after when we, when we look at infrastructure development. So one interesting question I've been fielding fairly recently, uh, fairly regularly recently, is, is really around what we mean by the term asset management. And often I think uh, the easy assumption is to assume that uh, we're talking about financial and investment assets. Um, but in this case, um, there is that asset management, but then there is asset management in the sense that Orion will be responding to the market in. Um, and that's really around the infrastructure asset itself and its ability to create the, the returns that are, are required from it. There's multiple layers of returns there. The service itself, um, what the asset is meant to generate or produce, uh, plus also the incentive for, for the market participants to create that asset, which is the returns to, to those investors and making sure you pay back your lenders and keep all stakeholders involved, including the communities and the people around them satisfied. Um, so really Orion Asset Management has been built and created for the purpose of responding to what we believe is a need for um, bringing in independent asset management to, to the realm of initially at least uh, renewable energy and the renewable energy generation assets that um, are, are growing across the country, um, but also potentially in the future water services where we see an opportunity that should be developing in the near future um, and various other infrastructure assets um, as markets for those develop as well. So the question really around, so what what is it about this point in time and this point in in the trajectory of renewable assets um, that makes makes it right for Orion to exist. Um, and if you really think about it, um, there are winds of change, there's rays of new light that, that are really having an impact on, on the market and for renewable energy in, in, the, in the country. Um, at policy level, there's, there's changes around what government is after, uh, the intentions in the long term around sustainability uh, in terms of uh, climate, in terms of uh, fossil fuel use. And as a result of that, there's also then significant changes around participants in the market. Um, as the market has grown and developed and been around long enough, uh, we see new buyers entering the market, different types and, and approaches to, to fulfilling the demand that's in them, uh, that's developed. And also at the same time, because of the the returns that have historically been generated, we see new participants in, in, in the shape of shareholders and investors. Um, these changes um, and the growth and the maturity of the market itself. So over time, we are seeing um, tariffs in, in, in the IPP per procurement program continuously decreasing uh, through competition, reflecting the fact that there are more market participants chasing to fulfill the same demand. We see a change in a refinement in, regulate, in the regulatory framework um, obviously, over time, the regulators themselves gain a better understanding of how to, to interact with market participants. And that is being seen in, in the way uh, the regulations are being applied to, to, to new rounds. They're also potentially seeing, in some cases, uh, the development of a secondary market around uh, generation assets, um, which, again, changes the profile of who is involved and what history they have around the, the development of that asset and how that impacts how it's operated going forward. Um, and increasingly, private off-takers off uh, entering the market directly and sourcing their own generation through, through, through private PPAs uh, in the commercial and industrial space. One of the other dynamics, which I think uh, is particularly significant when you're looking at it from, uh, from an owner or investor perspective is really around the dynamics and the cost structure of, of projects the changes in terms of cost of capital or debt or the debt portion of the cost of capital um, based on the interest rates that we're currently experiencing and the changes in, in, in the global macros. Um, then there's the cost of the capital to, to build the asset itself. Um, we 
see ever decreasing costs of of solar solar modules. We see uh, technology advances potentially bringing their cost down, but we also see uh, the entrance of of storage as a as a way of adjusting your the profile of your assets, um, and all of that at the end of the day filters through to to what owners and investors get as their return, um, and ultimately that is what is attracting participants to develop the assets that we need to meet the demand in the market. Um, then there's differences in the B funding costs, which are similarly associated to, to, to economic fundamentals. Against that backdrop, though, I think we, we, we can all recognize that, um, if anything, demand continues to grow. Um, I think we've seen multiple rounds of, of the government-driven procurement. Um, and already we, we are anticipating a new bid window, which will add to, to the existing number of assets in operation. Um, which will only add again to to the load and the effort required to to develop and to operate those assets going forward. We're also seeing, I think, uh, a large spike and a development in the private market and the private sector procurement of of generating capacity, um, and that's playing out significantly uh, in quite a rapid uptick in the size in the rate at which new projects are brought on board. Um, also, changing the size of those projects. Uh, and if you look at uh, projections from RMB side, uh, projecting up to 10,000 megawatts potentially in the next two or three years, which is a significant change and a significant acceleration in the rate at which projects are being brought on board. Um, and then, yeah, quoting uh, our, our moderator today, Chris himself, really looking at uh, behind the meter uh, projects and how they are projected to to add to the demand or to the capacity to meet demand within the market in the next few years. I think it's significant to note the, the number, the quantum of megawatts that will be brought on behind the meter um, in the beta generation projects. All of this, I think the point being is showing that with this level of demand in the market and the number of projects that are anticipated to come on board, um, I think we are all tapping into essentially the same resources in terms of uh, personnel, capacity, uh, capital, investors to, to produce all of those, uh, all of those required projects. Um, and what does that then mean? It, it means is at a premium, all market participants in, on all sides of the market um, in order to fulfill that demand and to, to produce at the rate that's required to do that. I think everyone is going to be pretty busy. Um, and ideally, you want to focus your efforts in the places where you believe uh, the best value for that effort is 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 found. I think a big consideration for all participants, again, is the availability of skills um, with the appropriate understanding of the market, especially bearing in mind the the tightening of the regulatory environment as as the maturity of the market develops. And that short supply of skills will, will definitely have an impact on how quickly we can meet demand. Um, and with the with, with the bid windows um, and the ever decreasing tariffs um, and potentially that, that kind of cost dynamics or price dynamics flowing through to the private sector procurement, I think margins for, for absorbing any inefficiencies have eroded, which means that you're going to have to run a pretty tight ship if you intend to meet the the returns that would keep uh, investors uh, attracted to the to the to the industry, so that we can uh, continue developing projects, and increasingly as well, I think uh, the costs that accrue to to non-compliance are significant, um, and those have the ability to threaten viability of projects going forward. Capture, um, and then also at the end of the day, I think. With the asset performing itself, the real key is around making sure you can capture and deliver and build every photon and every rotation of any any of your assets so that you can get the maximum revenue performance possible. At the end of the day, uh, I think all of these all of these risks end up at the doorstep of our owners and our investors in the market. Um, at the end of the day, they have to make sure that one, the way they develop those assets uh, sets them up for success. And then they have to make sure that those assets are run well enough to, to achieve the numbers that, that, that make the, the business worthwhile.
So this is where Orion really steps to the fore. Um, this is our intention and this is what we, we're looking to provide into the market is um, a service that would assist uh, investors and owners um, uh, of uh, utility scale facilities to meet the requirements to run and operate those assets properly over the duration of the of their PPAs, um, bringing together three major components in the sense of um, the commercial management of those assets, uh, ensuring that all of the, the mandatory necessary activities around running the, the asset as a as a commercial enterprise are met, and then also. Uh, Running the technical and the and the performance based uh, management of contracts, delivery of the asset itself uh, on the ground, so that it can produce the the returns that are required, um, and then looking after the the compliance portion of it. At the end of the day, the the, the renewables market is about sustainability um, and meeting those requirements and ensuring that those assets operate well uh, alongside the communities that they serve. Is going to be a critical point part of making sure that those assets do meet the requirements and perform and avoid penalties and costs. Those three work streams, um, we do break down into a set of different activities and different services that we, we're putting out into the market. Um, a variety of those which are captured on this presentation and the slide, but really it is around taking care of all of those essential day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month activities that will make the difference between um, whether or not the asset meets its full potential or not. This service offering, we, we really intend to, to deliver across um, a stretch of the, the project life cycle that covers the pre-COD portion. So from the point at which the, the asset enterprise or the asset company is, is created uh, through to the operations phase and over the full term, assisting owners and investors in making sure that they meet the requirements to to keep those assets performing at their best. Um, and this is really brought to or brought about through having dedicated management, looking at it from a commercial perspective to ensure that all aspects are, are covered, supported by a dedicated back office that that looks at the nitty-gritty from from site site inspections, from looking at the data of performance of the asset, from compliance with um, the company registration requirements uh, and compliance and reporting that are necessary to, to meet obligations. Um, and then bringing on the specialists within the, the support teams that will uh, find enhancements around how the asset performs in order to deliver the returns that we think investors and owners should be getting. So at the beginning, I did mention that one of the key portions of, of the offering is, is really bringing together three partners who are themselves experts within the market. They've got proven track record and are reliable, but um, through, their, through their partnership with us, they will be bringing their specialist services to the fore um, and will make sure that um, delivery through the Ryan vehicle is, is, meets the requirements of all of our stakeholders, all of our potential clients. Um, so Harmerton Renewables bring together um, a set of skills around the technical and environmental space within the renewable sector, um, and they have a track record uh, that speaks for itself. ED Platform are well known throughout the sector for, for their ability to, to assist uh, um, IPP in preparing themselves to meet the obligations that they, they have to, to, to communities and uh, economically within the country. And Cresco on the financial side, again, with a proven track record about, of assisting developers and IPPs in one, putting together those projects, uh, but also running those projects in a way that creates the returns that, that underpin the investment case for, for them. Really through this combination, but ultimately speaking to what we see as a market demand, we are hoping to find a space where we can bring our services to to bear on behalf of yourself as potential clients. Um, one to uh, to make the industry itself more viable, but also to create the space to meet the demand that is quite clearly building up. Um, yeah. So from my side, I really hope to hear from you soon. Uh, my details are shown there. Um, over to you, Chris, to introduce the next speaker. 
Thank you very much, Taf, for a really excellent presentation, uh, really crystal clear as to uh, the, needs, the needs of customers, the needs of IPPs, the needs of generators, uh, the needs of investors, uh, shareholders, uh, you know, and, and, and really, I think um, uh, this is a service that is well um, needed. Uh, and I believe from what I've heard uh, that you are really on top of this opportunity. So congratulations on, 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 uh, on this initiative. Uh, it's really now my pleasure to introduce the next presenter, uh, which is Rob Futter. Futter. Uh, Rob is really well known in the sector. And he's told me that he can't keep his camera on for too long. So you might just see his face flashing on now. Uh, but you know what bandwidth is like, and um, it, it, it's great to see you there, Rob. Rob is the CEO and Executive Director at Presco, a well-known financial services uh, company that uh, operates in the infrastructure sector, but specifically also a very significant involvement um, in the electricity, power generation, renewable energy sector. So, Rob, over to you, and we will understand if you have to shut your camera down. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, sorry, some technical issues in that, but uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, as everyone can see, I was supporting Portugal and South Africa this weekend at the World Cup, so just showing that off. Thank you, Taf. Um, next slide. So myself, uh, very engaged in the energy um, side of the world at the moment, in many cases primarily working for the buyers of power, but also for the sellers of power, and obviously coming across many new technologies that are slowly being in, uh, you know, sort of implemented PV and wind and now increasingly dispatchable technologies of, of various kinds. So next slide, please. So really the world has been moving for, for Cresco in terms of what we've been seeing. And, and a lot of the presentations we do, we talk about what did we do in 21, 22, 23, and 24 going forward. So I want to put this as a backdrop to, to my brief slides here. And as we have sort of the wheeling world move, which is now really, in my view, become a fully functional market in 21, really focused on, on wind and solar. Um, we then move into, call it commercial or part day ahead market type engagement, where we're slowly seeing some other type of technologies uh, come on board, a bit of um, ancillary service base in that. Then moving into potentially longer duration storage, slightly, not quite fully day ahead market yet, but, but getting there slowly and then slowly pushing towards, call it a fully liberalized market where we have various technologies of, of both dispatchable and non-dispatchable opportunity. And then from then to net zero, that's not the, the purpose of today's presentation. But this is very much the world that Cresco has been living in and very much the work that we've been doing uh, to date to, in the red and the yellow, mostly actual work on real projects in the green and, and the light and the dark blue, really projects that are in feasibility mode or in being procurement from various stages. Um, and at the moment, we're doing a lot of actual versus budget modeling for, for various clients. And this is some of the case studies that I've, I've brought out in, in the presentation. Um, next slide, please. So traditionally for our clients, we've been started with sort of off-site wheeling in 21, that moved on to on-site generation because of grid constraints. We found that a project in the Free State often has similar sort of uh, savings versus a project in the Rustenburg area, you know, with uh, the wheeling costs included. We've moved on to energy strategy work in 22. We've then really seen a movement towards cogen and, and BESS uh, in 22, 23, plus carbon in its infancy with renewable energy certificates. And there's a fair bit of work being done there. And then we've moved towards cross-border wheeling uh, in 23, 24. And over time, what we see as a real opportunity is this requirement for excess energy, you know, what happens to this energy itself, the balancing charges, time of use tariffs, and then what is the value of carbon over time and the environmental attributes attached to the PPA? And that's really the work that we are focused on and, and looking with many clients on in terms of how do they interact with IPPs going forward in 24, 25 as part of either the next round of procurement or around the day ahead market affecting them um, and how do they manage those risks, both IPPs and uh, for loads themselves. Next slide, please. So what we, a lot of the work we do, and this talks to the fact that we are of the opinion that many investors don't have access to sufficient real-time data to allow them to consider impacts. Um, and yes, they are getting uh, monthly financial statements, quarterly and that, but in many cases, it's probably not up to date and it's probably not projecting forward for scenarios that will affect them. So our typical actual versus budget model work that we would do under Orion and are currently already doing for many clients, uh, we take a typical trial balance 
We then put it into an operational model input sheet, uh, lots of different inputs, lots of different line items. And then ultimately that is pushed into projections, financial models that uh, mimic annual financial statements, in this case, an extract being the income statement. Um, and there we have notes on performance, actual versus budget. We have the monthly and quarterly projections. But more importantly, we have long-term views on over the PPA periods in terms of debt repayment periods and therefore proactive debt service cover ratio forecasting and proactive equity IR forecasting. Um, because for many investors, I think they're finding out a little bit retrospectively that their investments that they'd hoped would achieve these theoretical returns that are in the financial model and in reality are perhaps are not achieving that. Some good stories, some, yes, we met on the money, unfortunately, from what we've seen, some um, sad stories where the equity returns are, are substantially lower than they were expected. Next slide, please. So we've taken a, an example project where this project has been operating for six annual operating periods. We've graphed their actual versus the base case. On average, they've actually outperformed by 2%, but you can see quite significant seasonal variation um, in the analysis, as well as the fact that um, if you do it in the time of use periods, there's also been some interesting uh, differences. Not, not that the initial um, projections, at least at a REAP level, uh, were worried about time of use, but increasingly in the private sector, time of use generation and linking to offset of savings is becoming really important. And especially if we move towards time of use tariffs on the IPP side, uh, perhaps not the same level as the Megaflex tariffs, but I think uh, having a similar structure because um, we believe there will be harmonization there. And then obviously, as this generation comes in, we have this uh, theoretical, you know, this requirement for excess energy. And in, in this case here, it's a reproject. There, there is no excess energy. But if you told the buyer that you were only going to achieve the blue line and suddenly you're achieving the red line, you know, and the buyer cannot take that energy in reality, where does that excess energy go and, and how do we manage that? On the IR side, we're taking uh, the actual generation, the actual costs, the real end of job cost, capex, you know, final interest costs. Uh, if part of the funding wasn't fixed in, in many ways, and we do see a lot more fixed and floating various structures coming through. And even though in this case the actual generation was above budget, unfortunately the IR is is still lower. And and what we've seen is from many of these models is these early cash flows, maybe not all of them actually linked to generation is what's driving a deterioration in the IRR. And unfortunately for many projects, the tail of the projects is very much that's what, what is those cumulative equity returns on shareholder loan and dividends is what's driving the IRR. So if you're missing out in the early years, it's very hard to gain it back in, in the later years because the debt repayments typically take uh, a lot of the cash flows in the early years. And this is some of the experiences that Cresco's had in the actual versus budget experience and forecasting that we plan to bring to the Orion team. And, and this will help many uh, stakeholders in understanding either at a project level or hopefully at a portfolio level where they can op optimize over time. The last point is even though generation doesn't actually have a material impact uh, on the analysis there, um, in fact, you can see the gray and the, the, um, the yellow line being very close, material changes in generation does. And as I mentioned before, if we're linking this to time of use tariffs and, and generating in different time of use periods, this can affect the returns materially. Next slide, please. So when you go to the detailed level, you get the quarterly analysis and you can see lots of up, lots of downs. Um, you know, this is for, for a number of quarterly periods. And then from a debt service cover ratio point of view, um, you can see that the base case uh, is, and the actual case were not materially different. And even the 5% lower case is, is not actually materially different. And therefore debt, the cover ratios for this scenario were not significantly impacted, so the debt was still kept whole. But if you start running other scenarios around increased, uh, as I mentioned, time of use tariffs or asset uh, management costs increasing or the early cash flow is not available, then suddenly we see a significant movement in the base case and the debt service cover ratio is coming down to the 1.23 level where it makes everyone nervous. This, as I've showed on the previous slide, has a much bigger impact on the equity returns. But for many banks looking in and potentially looking to refinance, if your base case is now projecting a 1.2 times, you're probably not going to get the benefit of the refinancing structures. And so this sort of proactive reporting asset management work that we've mentioned along with our partners, ED Platform and Harmonton, that we're bringing through in the Orion operational vehicle is really important for, for many buyers uh, of the power, as well as for many IPPs who are selling this power into the market. Next slide, please. So in summary, 
the world is moving and, and is our own keeping up? This is no longer just about generating energy, putting it through an ESCA meeting and, and, and selling to reap. There's a lot of moving parts. So for us, there's been really five key takeaways from, from, from this. Um, so firstly, if you just sorry, click uh, next slide, please. So firstly, the, the IRR creep and the cost of debt has been increasing, as we've mentioned previously. This is having quite an impact. The BE vesting and the IPP obligations. So many of the private sector uh, procurements also have BE minimums um, diff set up quite differently to the way the REAP is structured. And what we've seen on a few real deals that are trying to get to financial close that we've had renegotiations from the IPP because the BE wasn't vesting and the initial equity return expectations that were set through weren't achieved. And obviously, if this is now happening at an operational level, once you're there, that's very difficult uh, chance because there's no real chance to change the equity return profile. The, the tariffs have been set under the process. Next one, please. Higher obligations from loads for the generators to generate in the time of use period. And the idea of minimum generation or guarantee generation or rolling generation and catch-ups and ledger systems, we see a lot of this wording coming in. And as, a, as the sort of phase two and phase three type of projects are rolled out, that we call them the procurements, at least in the private sector space, to build up to those 10,000 megawatts that we mentioned, we do see this as something that needs a lot more reporting and visibility from that point of view. Next slide. And then what happens to the excess energy risk? Um, if the buyer can't take it and the IPPs either over allocated the energy and the buyer is not there, how do they proactively um, understand that excess energy risk? But more importantly, where we're looking at more is the financial quantification of that excess energy risk and having some proactive forecasting and views of what you need to do. So if the generation is exceeded or the load cannot take it, you have a few price points. And so for us, this is really an important sort of value add from Orion as the market develops and liberalization comes. And, and this is uh, probably not part of our current, current offering that we're there, but we do see this as something that for the next range of IPPs coming through. And then the last point is the impact of the increasing network event and, and uh, force majeure implications. So we've had some work with some of the REAP projects, specifically COVID related, where there's been a fair bit of analysis done around um, FM events for REAP in terms of extension of PPA periods and that. In many cases, this has never resulted in the IR really getting back to what it should have been. But on the private PPA side, understanding network events, where that risk sits, the um, IPP proactively monitoring this is, is really important. So. You know, we believe that the very simple actual versus budget modeling that will now become part of the Cresco and um, the Orion scope and that will over time need to be enhanced with various visibilities to take into account a lot of these issues that we're seeing as part of as the market liberalizes and as IPP start offering more interesting deals as well as the traditional bilateral only deal more um, moving into the aggregator model or, or traders um, coming more to the table with larger volumes as these are built. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chris. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Rob. And I uh, hope everybody is seeing the slides. I had a little technical glitch on my side, and I wasn't seeing the slides transition. Uh, but I think it has come right now. But thank you very much, Rob, for those insights. Uh, and uh, I'm now going to introduce you to the next speaker, which is Chanda Nkumalo. Uh, Chanda is a director at Harmattan Renewables. And as you've heard, uh, Harmattan uh, are involved with uh, technical uh, consulting work uh, and an important partner in this uh, new business venture of Orion. So uh, I'd like to hand over to you now, Chanda. Thanks, Chris. Um, and hi, everybody. Um, I think I'll, I've tried to keep it relatively light because I know it's not a, a it's a not a super exciting topic so um we'll go um relatively quickly through it and then happy to take any questions um as Chris said I think next slide to um Harmattan are a technical advisory company um headquartered in South Africa and working on projects across the continent um you can go to the next slide um and so we the topic of asset management um I've put this 
cover page here. Um, it's a very useful document um, that was put together by Solar Power Europe um, that look, dives really into the best practice of asset management um, for specifically for solar PV projects, but um, it's also a useful guide um, and you can just find it on their website. So for anybody that wants to do a little bit more detailed reading. Um, next slide. Um, and Taf touched on this, but I think uh, from a technical um, perspective, just to go into a little more depth as to what asset management actually is. Um, ISO 55000 defines it as the coordinated activity of an organization to realize value from its assets. Um, and to do that, you need to balance costs, risks, opportunities, and, and performance. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, and I'm, I don't propose to read all of this, but really when we look at asset management, I think what we, we need to consider is that there are different points of view and different requirements from an owner, um, from an independent asset manager, and also from um, the OEM or the provider of operations and maintenance services. And if you're looking at the fundamentals that need to be managed under um, through asset management, you want reliable operation of a plant, you want reliable performance, ideally you would like reliable and predictable yield, lower operating costs, lower maintenance costs, and to, um, to extend the useful life of an asset. And in general, those requirements actually don't form part of the normal service agreement that you would have with an, um, an O&M provider. They're there to do um, monitoring of the operations of the turbines, to respond to um, unscheduled events, to respond to faults, but they're not necessarily there to provide a long-term um, view and to support the asset uh, with future looking predictive maintenance strategies or predictive um, performance um, analysis. And so I think it, part of why we've looked at setting up Orion is really to cover this and to support um, IPPs, uh, buyers, off takers in ensuring that the assets that they have are um, managed to optimize performance. So you can go to the next. Um, and so what, we've, what I've done is just look in, in a little bit more detail at what, what we're de defining as performance um, and then a case study from um, a project, um, a non-South African one, just so that we're not using um, confidential data, um, but looking at, at how we can actually manage this performance. So next slide, please. So if you look at what's been happening um, globally with assets, and this is um, an extract from an article, a May article from, from um, PV Magazine, solar assets are underperforming expectations by 8%. Um, and that's relative to the, the P50 production estimates. So this is these are global figures. If we go to the next slide, if we look at what's been happening in South Africa in particular, um, and here, the, for some reason, the Frank Sinatra when I was 17, it was a very good year, came into my head. So 2022, I think for those of you that are operating and have generation assets, was not a great year in terms of resource. Um, and so you'll see here where it's blue, white to blues is underperformance relative to 40 year averages. Um, so the left hand side is the sun, and the right hand side um, is, is the wind. Um, and for a little bit more on that, sorry, go to, you can go to the next slide um, tab. You'll see that on for wind 2020, 2021, relatively um, high wind speeds and overperformance. So the reds that you'll see across the South African map, whereas 2022, um, ma majority of the country um, was blue. And that was really a um, decline in wind speeds of up to 10% below a 30 year historical data set. So that's quite a significant um, underperformance relative to what you would have been forecasting in your financial model. Uh, next slide, please, Taf. Similarly on the solar front, um, and this is, it was a less significant deviation. So this was between two and 4% underperformance on the solar side, but still um, a decrease in irradiance um, as, relative to what was predicted. 
So next, next slide, please, Taf. So when we're looking at app performance, obviously the key input into how your plant is performing is the resource, but you have relatively limited ability to control that input. So what can we control? Um, and again, I don't propose to kind of read through this, but you know, when you're when you're setting up your asset management structure, when you're tracking your KPIs for how your plant is performing, um, you know, actual versus forecast, these are some of the things that you will want to, to be looking at. Um, how is the availability of the plant? Um, how, what is the net en energy output? What maintenance is happening scheduled versus unscheduled? Um, and then, you know, down into grid downtime, how the equipment is faring, uh, staffing, revenues, etc. Next, you can go to the next slide. I think one of the key things that I just I, that I, I want us to to point out is we we set up these KPIs and we set up these reporting structures, but as with everything, uh, data can be manipulated. So um, two very important phrases: lies, damn lies, and statistics. And do not believe in any statistic that you have not manipulated yourself. So as an IPP or an asset owner, you'll be receiving reporting on a monthly basis. Really important that you delve into that in detail and actually understand um, what it means um, and the impact of that on the performance of your plant. Um, you can go to the next slide, Taf. So as I said, um, a case study, and this is from a, a wind farm, um, looking at downtime um, allocated to various codes in the SCADA system. So you'll see from here that the the majority of the downtime, um, in fact, 75% of it falls under codes that are basically attributed to the, to the OEM. Um, so the manufacturer, your scheduled maintenance, your unscheduled maintenance. And that is about almost 90%, 89% of the lost kilowatt hours that you have on, on the plant. Um, you can go to the next slide, Taf. So what impact does this have in terms of revenue? And if we look, um, we took two months of the average cost of, um, of the downtime. Um, and if you look at this, then basically what you can see is that the manufacturer downtime um, is the most expensive. Utility is down there with environmental is, re is relatively, let's call it cheap downtime um, that you may, although there may be significant hours, it doesn't cost you a lot. And so the important thing I think here is what do you focus on in terms of ensuring that your performance is, um, is optimized? So if you go, go to the next slide, on this plant in particular, um, what we found is that when you looked at the wind speed versus the maintenance that was happening on the plant, they were inversely correlated. So uh, low low wind speeds, um, then they, they were not doing significant amounts of maintenance work. High wind speeds, turbines were being shut down. So that has an even greater impact on the, the revenue losses that you're suffering. And I think an important um, part of asset management is managing the uh, contractors, the teams that are on site and ensuring that that scheduled maintenance is done at appropriate times, ideally with low, um, low resource times and the response times to any faults are really um, tightly managed so that you're minimizing the downtime associated with any of those, those error codes. Um, you can go to the next slide. So what does this, this tell us? Um, really are the focus in terms of quick wins for optimizing your performance and increasing the revenue of your plant is minimizing the expensive downtime, um, maximizing the availability of your plant and ideally scheduling your, your outages and resources. Um, and you can go to the, the next, the last slide. Um, and all of that to say, what is the, the asset managers? And when, when I was trying to think of how to, to close it, Really, I thought you need to accept the things you can't change. So that's your your resource, essentially. Courage to change or outsource the management of the things that you can. And ideally, the wisdom to know the difference. Um, and in this age of AI learning, there's a lot of data that's there. But actually, this is a decision-making tool. Um, 
is quite useful uh, to focus on the things that are actually going to have a, a relatively high impact on your uh, on your assets performance um, and on the revenues of, of that. Okay, thank you. I think you can go to the last slide there, which has contact details. Thanks, Chris, over to you. Well, thank you, Chanda. You know, you said at the beginning that this wasn't a very interesting subject, but I thought it was <laughs> extremely interesting. And I loved your, your quotations about statistics, and so true, so true indeed. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, Chanda, for that uh, informative presentation. Uh, and we're going to move on now to our last presentation by Stephen Hawes. Uh, Stephen is the CEO of ED Platform, and ED, as you all have heard, um, is involved with ED and uh, broad-based black economic empowerment and environmental compliance. These um, hard issues, well, some call them hard issues, some call them soft issues, uh, but they're really important issues uh, in this environment, and it's something that has to be monitored closely, I am absolutely sure, but we're going to hear more about that from Stephen. So over to you now, Stephen. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, definitely a competition between between hard and soft issues, but I think we'll we'll see towards the end of this that um, most of it is contractually binding, and that makes it more of a hard issue than a soft issue. So, um, just a little bit of background about ED Platform. Uh, we've been operating in the renewable energy space in Southern Africa since 2011. And um, uh, basically on the back of the first bid window of, of uh, REAP and have expanded into other sectors and also into the private market. Thanks, Taff. You can continue. Um, so I'm going to talk individually a bit about environmental and then what we could call social or triple BE and ED compliance considerations and trying to tease out the kind of fundamental um, risks and potential issues for investors and lenders that, that are associated with those. I think the considerations under the environmental compliance, and this is largely for operational projects, um, is that the regulatory compliance to maintain the, the licenses and permits, that it has uh, implementation of the, the EMPR um, and management of those roles and re uh, responsibilities under that EMPR, and then also meeting lender requirements are the major environmental compliance considerations. Essentially, there's a requirement for project owners or asset managers to meet and address all of those considerations to remove the risks that they create for projects, whether those risks are under its agreements for uh, with the, the DFFE and other, other governmental uh, stakeholders or with lenders. Next slide, please, Taff. Um, and then with the triple BE and ED, I'm going to distinguish between REAP and the private PPAs because they are quite different. Um, under REAP, it's quite well known. There's very specific uh, uh, ED sub elements, which are uh, uh, bid at the bid stage are essentially made as commitments, um, which are coded into the IA. Um, these are very interesting to lenders because those uh, commitments can trigger penalties which interrupt cash flows and returns of the projects and therefore some strict conditions and early warning mechanisms are usually inserted into the funding documents associated with those projects. Um, those, those are usually uh, negotiated at financial close and then it seems that sometimes that you know when projects go into operations they're forgotten about until um, the, a problem arises, but they are very important because there are termination events associated with some of the non-performance, um, and before that termination, there is significant financial penalties that can that can can come about. So it is of of extreme interest to both lenders and shareholders. Next slide, please, Taff. Um, under the the new private PPA scenarios. I think the compliance here for, for this, let's call it the social compliance, um, is multifaceted. There's a, a sort of mishmash of different requirements under the different uh, off-taker programs that have been run so far, and we'll, we'll get to that a bit later. There's an example we've got of, of, of how different those things look. Um, but the commonalities are that they, um, they culminate in events of default under the PPA, which are either associated with sort of contractual uh, termination or some sort of penalty regime. Um, and those differ from PPA to PPA. 
but essentially uh, they they become disruptive to the cash flows of the projects. Uh, they can be disrupt, become disruptive to the contractual, the smooth contractual functioning of those projects between the off taker and the seller. Um, and obviously that plays into the lenders uh, funding agreements where these events are, are dealt with upfront. Next slide, please, Tav. So the bottom line in, in, in the case of these considerations is that these penalties and, and contractual sanctions affect the project cash flows and returns and therefore should be considered as hard issues. Um, and mitigation of these is very desirable. So if we look at some of the known issues um, and, and mitigation for the environmental compliance, I think it's largely based on, on, on two fa major factors. One is kind of non-compliance with the agreements with uh, the DFFE or the Department of Water Affairs and Sanitation, um, and then also sort of stakeholder and reputational issues. Um, and these generally result in adverse findings where lenders come and audit the compliance with the EMPR, um, or you have uh, some sort of stakeholder management process that creates a lot of grievances. Um, so mitigation of that is effective and timeless communication with stakeholders, specifically community members, um, effective implementation of the EMPR, um, and then utilizing internal um, review mechanisms in order to preempt any issues that arise, um, both of which require effective and timeless management. So these issues kind of creep up on projects um, and they don't, you know, they're not always addressed timelessly. And that means that when they do hit, um, it's kind of all at once and becomes quite overwhelming. Uh, yeah, known issues under REAP. I think anybody who's been in the market for a while will understand this, is that REAP, um, part of the award mechanism is the, the, the sort of scale of your ED commitments. So well, this is up until about bid window five. Um, and you know, th this is where we have had some projects with very high ED obligations that are set due to this competitive bidding. So there becomes a very practical difficulty in performance. And sometimes there are also difficulties in actually collecting data um, and reporting effectively on these, which is a requirement under the, the agreement signed with the, with the DMRE. Um, and then sometimes the performance is also difficult because simply there is a change in the underlying assumptions about who appropriate suppliers or beneficiaries may be, um, and, and that makes performance difficult. Um, some of these risks can be passed through to contractors using solid contracting processes um, into which effective monitoring and reporting processes are built. Uh, these have become fairly standard. I think uh, in some cases are, are being overlooked in, in the interest of other factors, specifically commercial factors in some cases, but they are no less important. Uh, so we, we, we recommend that those solid contracting processes remain. Um, in some cases where you have difficulties in performance, you can make arrangements with the regulator, which in this case is the IPPO. Um, we've seen some good programmatic um, ED uh, expenditure programs being approved by the IPPO, which sort of relieves some of the pressure. Um, and then I think employment of specialists, um, essentially outsourcing some of the functions is, is, is proven beneficial, uh, specifically improving the performance of expenditure, uh, usually under the social components of the enterprise development and socioeconomic development expenditure um, is, is more effectively executed by specialists and that also allays some of the community level risks that arise. Next slide, please, Taf. So you can go one back, please. Thanks. Under the private PPAs, um, a lot of the compliance focus is centered around the triple B E level. And this is co coded into the PPAs as kind of like a non-negotiable. So the penalty regimes are being triggered if your uh, BE level falls below a specific uh, uh, level, and sometimes the, the level that is required is quite difficult to attain. And that's specifically due to the structure of the companies. Uh, project finance, SPVs are not really what the triple BE codes had in mind when they were drafted, uh, or at least the drafters of the codes had in mind when they drafted the, those codes. 
Um, and sometimes it becomes difficult to perform um, in a standardized BE environment as that sort of SPD. In addition, there's kind of like, a, as I mentioned earlier, a, a sort of mishmash of different requirements and, and, and a lack of standardization of terminology in relation to the various compliance components that you find in the private PPA market. So it, it becomes confusing, specifically if you have a, a, an asset owner that may have projects bidding into multiple off-takers, uh, where one, in one case, for example, local content means one thing and another means an, a different one. You need to have your finger on the pulse and make sure that you don't um, fall foul of any of those requirements. Um, some of the good mitigation we've seen of these triple BE level issues is in this YES program, which is a, a structure allowable under the triple BE codes. Um, does create a little bit of its own risks. There's some sort of sub-minimum criteria we need to meet, so you need to be very careful um, about how you do implement it, but it does sort of allow for the attainment of higher triple B contributor status levels for some of these uh, project finance vehicles. Um, and then another good mitigation is just to make sure that your project is triple B verification ready. Uh, I think there's something uh, to learn from that. A lot of um, asset owners that have only been involved in REAP um, have had limited experience with that sort of um, uh, readiness that is required in terms of keeping data, keeping records, et cetera, um, and actually just getting that verification process lined up with what is required in the PPA. So I'm gonna talk about some contracting aspects for environmental and for, for ED and, and BEE. Um, yeah, so the contracting aspects, I think that are important under the environmental considerations are specifically the licenses and permitting agreements. This is usually with the DFFE and the water, uh, the, the DWS, um, that allows for the 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 maintaining of the permits and licenses requirements um, that the projects have to to, to maintain throughout their life cycle. Um, also, the ONM contracts. I think that's something that uh, the the EMPR is usually executed by uh, uh, in conjunction with the asset manager, the ONM contractor. And then lastly, uh, any um, environmental compliance, specifically audits, et cetera, that are required by the lenders. It's also contracted in. Next slide, Taf. For triple B, E, and E, D, um, under REAP, I mean, the IA is the main governing uh, agreement that is that is that that forms the foundation of those ED obligations. Um, but underneath that, the pass through of those obligations through to the EPC and ONM contractors, uh, with with the exception of a few uh, of those obligations, which are only able to be for, be performed by the SPV, that's highly important. Um, these are monitored by the IPP office quarterly. These obligations, um, and also from bid window three point five, which was the CSP window, onwards, also annually, including the requirement for an annual audit. Um, and then once again, the lenders come into play in the in the funding agreements, that reporting and early warning um, advisory are built into those agreements. Um, similarly, under the triple, B, the triple, sorry, uh, thanks. Uh, the private PPA, um, the triple B e contributor status uh, comes into play. It's something that is not able to be contracted away. So it's it's definitely. Um, you know, what the BE level of your suppliers, et cetera, is, is something that you do need to build into your um, subcontracts, but uh, the responsibility for that is taken on by the IPP itself. Next slide, please, Steph. So I think the bottom line under the contracting is that there's a lot of pressure on, on, on management teams. Um, there's a multitude of those contractual provisions that have to be you have to keep your finger on the pulse and make sure that you don't fall foul of any of them. Um, and this is essentially what an asset manager uh, does. And it's it's uh, usually required to be reported to the board and to lenders on a, on a, a frequent basis. This is just an example of some of the uh, current off-taker um, requirements under the private PPA just to demonstrate uh, the, what I was mentioning earlier about the differences in, in the compliance requirements. So for example, some of them have, or most of them I should say, 
have a minimum black ownership level that they ask for. And this is obviously a consideration of their procurement department for the B, the triple BE performance of the off taker itself. Uh, coupled to that is the triple BE contributor status level that they request and code into the PPA. Um, some of them have neglected to do that, but most of them have have um, have inserted that, and we've seen anything between level four all the way up to level two. Another component, which is, I suppose, a carryover from REAP is the community ownership component. Um, whilst it is a good, a good uh, best practice um, aspect of, of these projects, it's not something that is featured in all of them, um, but some of them have made it mandatory. And then you'll be able to see that some of the, the, the off takers have also requested uh, you know, a certain percentage of the contract value or the revenue to be expended on uh, things like skills development, socioeconomic development, um, enterprise development, et cetera, both on site of the projects and also in the, uh, the communities in which um, the off taker operates. Some of it's split between, you know, if it's a wheeling project uh, and not an on-site project, the requirement is split, split between the two sites that are relevant. Next slide, please, Taf. It's the last slide. There's some future considerations which are coming through that we are seeing. Um, quite recently, we've had some supply chain monitoring or what we would call human rights due, due diligence and reporting coming through. And this is where um, asset owners are required to investigate this, the, the labor and, and uh, workplace-oriented practices that are related to human rights uh, throughout the supply chain and report on those uh, specifically to lenders. We are also seeing this particularly in the aggregator slash trader uh, environment that environmental and socioeconomic attributes which are associated with the power generation and that is delivered to those uh, off takers um, are required to be audited and, and certified, so to speak, um, in order to for those off takers to uh, to gain those attribution of the of the environmental components, and that's carbon and water specifically. Sometimes they like to report on things like land use as well, um, and then from an ESG reporting perspective, the sort of socioeconomic and uh, employment creation aspects are becoming important to uh, off takers of of the energy as well. I think that's all from me. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much uh, in, indeed, Stephen. And yes, uh, hard issues versus soft issues. You've uh, convinced me that when there's contractual obligation, these are seriously hard issues and uh, not just warm and fuzzy, feel good issues uh, to be to be met if you want to. So thanks very much for that. And ladies and gentlemen, we are running late time-wise. Uh, we intended to be completed by now, and it's three minutes past one. Uh, I will understand if some of you have to leave at this stage, but we're going to carry on with the Q&A for another 15 minutes uh, because I think there is interest uh, for those that are can stay on and want to stay on. I think there's some issues to be covered. Fortunately, um, uh, my presenters have been extremely helpful. Um, I've asked them to try and answer many of the questions um, you know, the on the text Q&A uh, whilst this webinar is in progress. And I see a total of 17 questions have been answered and there are now currently a total of five issues that remain open. And that's going to help things, uh, speed things up uh, greatly. So um, I'd like to uh, really uh, look at this, uh, some of these open questions and uh, see whether we can, uh, we, we can uh, deal with them. Now, I see the first one by... Uh, Dipur uh, Mahapa. Uh, I think this uh, was really addressed to Tef uh, because he had a slide, actually a slide that I produced <laughs> uh, as part of uh, some work I did for a client about the growth in demand of the domestic and commercial sectors and asking what method was used uh, to derive this. Well, I'm very happy to put this to Tef, but just to say on my side, uh, please do contact me afterwards uh, because that slide that Tef showed 
uh, was from some of the work that I did, and I can explain the methodology used. I think, if anything, the figures are on the very conservative side because of the massive growth that we are seeing in the commercial uh, and domestic sectors. But it's very much driven by load shedding. And, and if uh, levels of load shedding were to change uh, in the next year, uh, you know, the picture could change as well. Uh, but there, of course, is also the economic uh, driver, uh, which which uh, is likely to become stronger in years to come. But Taff, do you want to quickly handle that? Um, yeah, part of handling it is obviously to cite yourself. Um, I think you're a trusted voice within the within the market, um, and also just to show that there's a significant correlation between various sources around those those kinds of projections. Um, and in effect, the the purpose of that slide was to show that. Um, if those views do pan out, then there's going to be a significant amount of of requirement for for the additional skills necessary to to meet that demand. Um, but I would happily refer that question to you for for the specific method on your calculation. Yeah, I think if if the uh, questioner could contact me, I'll, I'll be able to help. Um, there's another question here by Mli Matwani. I hope I've got the pronunciation right. It says I'd like to figure out the process for managing our EPCs. So a lot has been talked about the different uh, management processes and monitoring processes, and early warning signs, et cetera, et cetera. And I agree that uh, the EPCs and its monitoring is important. Uh, is there anybody on the panel uh, that would might like to talk to this? Chanda, maybe you're the right person because you're sort of on the technical side of things, uh, but uh, maybe anyone else would like to step in and answer that question. Sure. I think he, he also put a, a, a second question about how to organize the, the MMRA. Um, like I think, and Rob will probably jump in here, but when you run the, the RFP process for your EPC, it's really important for you to specify exactly what you're asking for um, from a technical point of view. So defining your employer's requirements properly. Um, and then in terms of the, the the maintenance reserve account, that really is very much dependent on the technology that you're using and the equipment that's going to be supplied, but also on what the O&M contract itself looks like and what's included there, whether you actually need an MRA or whether everything is covered under that O&M contract. So and I know that's probably how long is a piece of string is an answer, but it really very much depends on the, the contract structure that you put in place for the for the project. Thank you. Robo, is there anything you'd like to add to that? I think that's all good. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, then we'll move to the next question uh, here. Uh, and uh, I'm looking at a question here by um, Michelle uh, Rivarola. Uh, Michelle asks, uh, what protection does the investor have in the event of a default? Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think the investors uh, take risks, <laughs> but uh, I'm not the expert. Uh, is there anybody on the panel that wants to answer this? Thanks. I guess, I mean, I'll start with the one and maybe Steve can jump in with the, with the other one. So there's obviously default under the PPA, and its obligations, and then there's default under any funding uh, commitments uh, required, and then there's obviously other defaults around ED and, and BE and things like that. So, I mean, ultimately, each of these potential defaults are, man are identified by Orion up front. We plan to implement some reporting systems, and then we report against those uh, along with some recommendations to, you know, sort of implement them as appropriately. And if it's within our remit, we can assist the client in Im implementing those specific interventions as, as required. So it really depends on, on the, the default scenario. It's quite a broad question because it can cover basically all the project risks that you could think of. Um, over to you, Stephen. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I see a real challenging question here <laughs> uh, uh, from Penny uh, uh, Herbst. Uh, Penny was asking a question. I see it seems to... Oh, there it is. Yeah. She says, yeah, are you saying process was flawed and that there was a lack of due diligence by financial institutions, debt and equity regarding the skills required to manage these assets. How is it playing out in the CNI market? Surely IPPs should be adequately resourced. So I, I think what Penny is getting at is why should there be a need for a third party uh, outsourced uh, management solution? Surely this uh, should be built into the IPPs themselves. I hope I've got the question right, Penny, but anybody on the panel like to handle that? Taff, maybe you'd like to come in here. Tap, do you want to answer? 
Yeah, um, I think I, I wouldn't go as far as to say there's a, there was a flaw in the in the process, but um, I think the nature of resolving this is partly in the processes that you have in place. But those processes will inevitably be implemented by by personnel, by people. Um, and at the end of the day, as we see the demand growing, I think one of the stress points in the market will be the availability of the the people with the right skills. Um, in every one of those IPPs in order to to run those assets properly. Um, and people are fairly mobile. Uh, I think we can see that in the market currently, that um, skills are being drawn and pulled to to different different operators and different IPPs and their EPC space. And uh, all of that is ultimately putting strain on the ability of those uh, key key skills like we have in the team that we've built to respond to to the needs of, of owners and investors uh, these projects so it wouldn't be necessarily a, a, stru a structural fault in the in the in the process but i think as we see dynamics in the market it does start to put pressure on on the ability of all of those operating assets to be run for correctly and, and maybe i could just supplement that chris quickly is you know having done a number of projects implemented them taken the constructions and then reporting on actual outside of the energy sector so this will be healthcare mining projects Excel is not a perfect tool. It's only as good as the quality of the inputs and the world changes. And that's around managing proactively how the world change and how do you mitigate against those. So it, it's not just IPP specific. You can name any sector and they would have these issues. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, I see a question from Jacques Milan, uh, which says, can wind and solar, for that matter, forecasting be improved by utilizing artificial intelligence tools to dovetail maintenance, are these pro are there projects looking into this, or are tools already available? Again, I think there's a technical question here for for Chanda. Chanda, would you like to tackle that? Sure. Um, so yes, they can be improved, and there are um, AI tools. The forecasting basically market, and there's companies that really focus only on delivering for um, forecasting. Um, uses a lot of AI and feedback loops for um, improvement. Um, what you'll see is as well in terms of the data that a lot of it is now being improved specific to the African continent, because previously we, we were using, for example, satellite data that was um, European based, essentially. So there, there is a, a feedback loop. I think what where the issue comes in with dovetailing with the maintenance is that you've got the asset manager or you've uh, either external or internal to the IPP. And then you've got a, a third party in a lot of cases, O&M contractor that does the maintenance. So they are not necessarily um, incentivized or their contract is not necessarily set up in order for them to schedule the maintenance um, relative to the forecasting. They will just say, well, we have to do five services a year or panel cleans a year and we do them when we get to your site and this is when we have people and it's not necessarily at the best time. So it's also a, a matter of using the tools and the information to then manage the people um, delivering that service or doing the maintenance. Thank you, Chanda. I want to address this one to Stephen, if I may. Um, uh, Stephen, the question here uh, from Litsebe Jimson uh, says, to what extent does regulation regime, does the regulation regime affect viability? And I, I, I'm here talking more towards your end of, of, of the activities, uh, the, the ED and the uh, BEE and the environmental and these kind of regulatory aspects. How does this affect the technical, uh, well, how does this affect the, uh, you know, the viability of IPPs in renewable energy? Yeah, I mean, I think you can look at it in a couple of ways. Um, you know, obviously, viability in terms of financial viability, these aspects sometimes do add costs onto the projects. Um, however, if everybody in the market is operating on the same level playing field, then I think um, the comparative viability is unaffected. It's just that uh, sometimes the, the cost uh, might be increased if there are very significant, um, let's call them social goals of a program. So for example, um, in, in other countries, local content type programs, and this is not only in the energy sector, but also in things like technology, I'm thinking of places like South Korea, um, where there was a very strong focus on local content, initially kind of raised the cost 
of 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 uh, the the outputs of those industries, um, but over time built competitiveness because of your um, uh, you know building an industry inside the country. So you know mm-hmm. from a financial viability perspective, that might be one consideration. I suppose uh, viability from a um a a uh, like a, te- a, a theoretical technical possibility in other words if there if there's regulations related to the the actual technologies i would probably defer to chanda on that on that basis um i think uh should be a better place to answer that question look i'm going to move on because we really are over time and coming to an end now uh, a, a question uh, from uh, uh, Jacques Kihani says, are there shortcomings in making use of satellite weather data in Africa is, is added to the question. So uh, uh, Chanda, can you quickly handle that one? Sure. So um, satellite data for PV projects is is a bankable mechanism um, for you to do energy resource assessments. Some satellite data service providers are more considered more bankable than others. So you just need to do a little bit of research into which have the the highest uh, um, uncertainties and which are most acceptable. For wind, um, satellite data in general is not used for bankable resource assessments. You need to actually measure on the on the site and have a met mast installed or um, sometimes a LIDAR or SODAR, but um, yeah, the, you, uh, you can for PV projects use satellite data is the short answer. Thank you. Uh, question, and I'm going to make this the last question, if I may. Uh, Penny Herbst, uh, a second question from her. Uh, and she says, will there be a repricing of management costs for forthcoming rounds to accommodate an additional entities in the value chain? Uh, Penny, I, I, I was thought I was hearing that they're going to be reduced costs by the result as a result of these uh, outsourcing and professionalization uh, and and uh, uh, of these uh, management services. Uh, but uh, w- w- Rob, why don't you step in here and tell us: Is there going to be a reduced cost or increased cost? Well, I mean, the question is: What is the true cost? Eh? Um, so yeah, yeah. you know, we 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 have a lot of round five projects that didn't achieve financial close and round sixes that aren't there. So you know, have people actually put their best foot forward across all the components, CapEx, OpEx, SPV services, GNA. Um, as Cresco, we have um, information from previous private sector rounds around SPV costs and GNA, and we have some benchmarking and things like that. And it's very difficult to benchmark what's in and what's not. Because just with this, uh, you know, when people say, what does Orion charge? It really depends on what are you asking for in terms of your offering. So it is a very bespoke uh, question. I think the idea, however, is if you're doing this for five projects, your average cost per megawatt would be lower than if you have a dedicated team for one project. And I think that's what Orion's working on, is the portfolio approach, because 80% of the work will be generic, 20% will be project specific. So the idea is to get the the sort of that sort of cost that can be sort of um, create scale or get economies of scale. We That's what Orion's offering here, whereas obviously the on the ground cost be it security or cleaning panels or the actual o and it's very difficult to get that scale out of these businesses. Thank you. Thank, yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting answer. There's a last question. I, I, I'm going to actually ask to pass on this question by Tabo Msiba, uh, Msiza. Uh, he asks, are there investors interested in IPPs contracted to metro municipalities? I think, Tabo, this is a little bit beyond the scope of, of this particular uh, webinar. Uh, you know, when you're asking, are there investors interested in metro municipalities? I think that's another question. So if we may kindly defer on that. So ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this uh, webinar. For me, it's been a great, uh, interesting uh, webinar. Uh, We've heard about the the need for uh, proactive management as opposed to uh, reactive responses, the need for professionalism and for effective and timely as management. Uh, and, And this outsourcing to specialists, I would think, is an endeavor to actually uh, professionalize and, and ultimately, uh, you know, to get better uh, uh, you know, asset management, uh, which uh, ultimately, uh, you know, is a saving and not an extra cost. Uh, that's my personal view. Um, yeah, we talked about the hard and the soft issues. I think these are all really hard issues, a whole lot of them. Every one of our presenters was dealing with 
uh, hard issues, uh, you know, about delivery and service and investment and returns and, and things that are going to make projects viable and, and avoid uh, defaults. So I, I thanks to all the presenters for uh, their wonderful uh, contributions to this discussion. Thanks to all the people, uh, you know, asking the questions and the people who attended. I hope that you found it uh, as useful as I did. Uh, I'd like to now hand uh, back uh, to uh, Taff McQuenna, the CEO of the new Orion Asset Management Company, to have the last word. Over you to over to you, Taff. Great. Um, yeah. First, I'd just like to thank you, Chris, for for hosting and and having us um, on the webinar to present our offering. Um, again, thank you to to the people who made time to to join us today. Um, hopefully, there's um, at least something in the presentation that you can take away, um, and I'll be. Uh, looking forward to yeah calls and contacts from you where where the opportunity exists for us to provide the service to you. Um, I think as you put very well, Chris, the intention isn't to make it harder, but to make it easier for for assets to perform and deliver the power that that we clearly need in the country. Um, and yeah, our, our our services, our expertise are there and ready for 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 use by you. So yeah, forward to meeting you. Um, and I think maybe just a note, uh, we, we will be having our official launch in uh, this time next week. Uh, Chris will be sending a, a link to, to registration for that event. Um, and I, I hope uh, many of you will be joining us for that uh, and we can get into more detail about our offering. Um, thank you once again for, for sparing the time. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks to everybody for attending. Uh, that's all for today. Uh, you can expect a follow-up report uh, within the next 24 hours giving you the links to the video, the links to the presentations themselves, and of course, the link uh, to register for this uh, official launch of uh, Orion Asset Management next week. Um, thanks again to all uh, and uh, good afternoon.